Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and last time, Longstreet headed east to the Confederate capital, Richmond, then proceeded north to Manassas Junction to join Beauregard's army. Now, he will experience his first taste of Civil War battle. Gorey, the young man whom Longstreet met on his travel from Texas to Louisiana, and who continued to accompany him to Richmond, became a volunteer aide to the new general, with the unofficial rank of captain. One of Longstreet's biographers explained his selection of his staff members. Gorey typified the caliber of young men whom Longstreet would select for his staff. The general was an excellent judge of talent, seeking individuals of intelligence and perception who had organizational skills. He sought neither sycophants nor fools. Men of keener intelligence than himself did not threaten Longstreet. Confidence in his own abilities allowed him to fashion a personal staff that became one of the finest, if not the finest, in the Army during 1862 and 1863. A young Alabamian residing in Mississippi when the war broke out joined his staff as well. His name was Peyton T. Manning, and he graduated from Georgia Military Institute in 1859. The small, thin man was intelligent, and as one observer said, had a quick, clear mind. Another man that joined his staff was also from Alabama, but was residing in Mississippi when the war broke out as well. His name was Thomas Walton. He had been a lawyer before the war and attracted Longstreet's attention when he arrived in Virginia. Walton possessed an explosive temper that he could easily unleash on anyone who crossed him. Dr. Dorsey Cullen also joined Longstreet's staff as the brigade's medical director. Beauregard assigned Frank Armistead to Longstreet's staff when he arrived at Manassas Junction, but he would leave the group by the end of the summer. As the Union Army lurched toward the Confederate Army at Manassas, Beauregard began deploying his troops at vital locations. Some of those areas of importance were the fords across Bull Run, and the commanding general assigned Longstreet's brigade the duty of holding Blackburn's ford. At a little before 11 a.m. on July 18th, Longstreet, perched atop his horse, could see the Union soldiers maneuvering toward his position as he looked through a pair of opera glasses that he borrowed from a member of Beauregard's staff. At 11, the silence broke with artillery blasts from the Union guns opposite Longstreet's position. The general jumped off his horse, dropping the opera glasses and losing them, disappointing the staffer who had purchased them years earlier in Paris, France. Some Massachusetts soldiers approached Longstreet's men and the two sides fired volleys at one another. The first taste of combat rattled many young men in the brigade, and some began to flee. Longstreet, with a cigar in one hand and a sword in the other, rallied as many men as possible and sent the Federal troops back across the ford. After the small attack by a few companies of Bay Staters, Colonel Israel Richardson's entire brigade made repeated attacks against Longstreet's three regiments. As the battle ebbed and flowed, Virginians began to scamper to the rear, either overcome with fear or doing so under the guise of helping a comrade to safety. Longstreet had no choice but to request reinforcements from Beauregard, who dispatched Jubal Early's 3 Regiment Brigade and 7 artillery pieces from the Washington Artillery to Longstreet's aid. Longstreet later recalled that Beauregard might have been irritated around that time because a Union artillery shell struck the kitchen of the McLean home and disrupted his meal. When one of Early's regiments arrived, they lined up behind Longstreet and his brigade higher on the hill but at the same height as Longstreet. As the general attempted to get out of the way of the men preparing to fire, he dove from his horse to the ground to avoid being shot and lay there until the men fired their volley. Somehow his horse was unscathed. With the increased firepower of Early's regiment, the Union line began to buckle and Longstreet raced to the front of his line and ordered a counterattack, which only a few companies heard, but that was enough to send the Union brigade out of the rifle range of Longstreet's men. The Confederates returned to their former positions as both sides' artillery pieces dueled until darkness covered the battlefield. During the night, Early's brigade relieved Longstreet's men and took their place, with Longstreet's brigade going to a stand of pines to rest and regroup. Beauregard would say of Longstreet's actions, By his presence at the right place at the right moment among his men, by the exhibition of characteristic coolness, and by his words of encouragement to the men of his command, he infused a confidence and spirit that contributed largely to the success of our arms on that day. Longstreet suffered 68 casualties and collected accolades from many other commanders and men who saw his actions on the field. Between the fight on July 18th and the resumption of the fighting on July 21st, Joseph E. Johnson's army in the Shenandoah Valley arrived at Manassas Junction to reinforce Beauregard. 
Johnston and Beauregard convened to construct a battle plan, and it was decided for the Confederate left to outflank the Union right, but what they didn't know was that the Union commander, Irvin McDowell, was proposing a similar strategy to use his right flank to outflank the Confederate left. So on July 21st, the Union right and Confederate left met on Matthews Hill and Henry House Hill and battled it out, while the right of the Confederate line that was supposed to advance stalled because Richard Ewell's brigade on the far right never got the orders to advance. Longstreet's and some of the other brigades moved anyway, but fell back to their positions across Bull Run. Between 5 p.m. and 6 p.m., a courier from Johnston ordered Longstreet to form his brigade and link up with Brigadier General Millage Bonham's brigade to his left and pursue the retreating Federals who were running toward Washington, D.C. Longstreet and Bonham's brigades advanced a short distance, but an artillery battery stood in their way. The Union battery fired shells over the heads of the Confederates, but posed little danger. Bonham, who outranked Longstreet, lost his nerve and ordered a retreat. Longstreet and two of his aides, Frank Terry and Thomas Lubbock, two of the Texans Longstreet had met along with Gorey on their travels to Richmond, went ahead and scouted the position and found a way to capture the guns. Longstreet was enraged at the order to retreat. He rode to Bonham and asked permission to charge the battery, but Bonham said we must go back that a glorious victory might not be turned into a terrible disaster. Longstreet insisted that he could capture the battery without the loss of a single man, reach Centerville, and pursue all the way to Washington, but Bonham would not change his mind. Soon, a courier from Johnston arrived telling them that the Confederate right flank was being turned and to retreat. Now Longstreet bristled with rage. He said that the Union Army was running for their lives, that the intelligence that their flank was being turned was absurd. Longstreet threw his hat on the ground and threw many choice words in the general direction of anyone around him. He said, retreat, the Federal Army has broken to pieces. Nevertheless, Longstreet halted his command, but it took hours for him to cool off. A gentleman who was new to Longstreet's staff arriving that morning got to see Longstreet's anger firsthand. The young man's name was Moxley Sorrell. He was a 23-year-old South Carolinian with a temper of his own and had been a bank clerk in Savannah before the war, but he would become one of the most trusted members of Longstreet's staff. He had arrived that morning sent to Longstreet from Beauregard because the Brigadier General had asked for additional staff. Sorrell described his new commander as a most striking figure, about 40 years of age, a soldier every inch, and very handsome, tall and well-proportioned, strong and active, a superb horseman, and with an unsurpassed soldierly bearing, his features and expression fairly matched. Eye glint blue steel, deep and piercing, a full brown beard, head well-shaped and poised. The worst feature was the mouth, rather coarse. It was partly hidden, however, by his ample beard.